So I decided to do a series of videos on not only pulp fantasy like uh, Conan the Chimerian, but also on the Lord of the Rings series by Tolkien. Really looking forward to doing that before I leave the United States to go to India, because I was looking back over um, some old posts of the Archdruid Report by John Michael Greer, and I remember a very memorable post from 2012 in which he describes what's actually going on in a world past the peak of global petroleum production. We hit peak oil in 2005, and then the recession of 2008 was just the natural consequence of having hit peak oil, as was predicted for decades, and the economic political dysfunction worldwide that has followed and has, you know, maintained since then has not gone away is something which we can't really talk about or understand for narratological reasons. Despite claiming that we have a wealth of ways of understanding the world, really everything boils down to the one narrative of progress since we can't think outside narrative any more than we can speak outside language. Wittgenstein said that you can't actually take a position outside language in which you describe language from the outside. Your position is always somehow stuck within it. And it's the same thing with narrative. We really can't think outside narrative, even things that seem to be completely unaffected by narrative, completely indifferent to narrative like science, really is going on the way we do it within the narrative of scientific progress. Science is done within the narrative of we started as cavemen who were very primitive, then we discovered science. And ever since then, we've been making progress to the point that someday we're all going to live forever because Ray Kurzweil says the computers are going to figure out how to save us from dying and then we'll be downloaded into machines and live forever as disembodied subjects high on drugs for all of eternity. This is actually what Ray Kurzweil claims. And since we cannot think outside narratives, we need some other narrative to think about what's actually going on around us, which the narrative of progress has ceased being useful to describe. And he showed that it's actually pulp fantasy, which gives us those resources. I'll read this quote real quick. We live in a world dominated by a vast, slowly decaying empire that gets quite literally superhuman powers by feeding on what we might as well call the blood of the earth, also known as oil. That empire is ruled by a decadent aristocracy that holds court in soaring towers and bolsters its crumbling authority by conjuring vast amounts of wealth out of thin air. We also call that banking. Um, Backing the aristocracy is a cast of corrupt sorcerers whose incantations projected into every home through the power of the blood of the earth keep the populace disorganized, deluded, and passive. The idea here that the elites don't actually get their power from anything except stealing the energy from the blood of the earth. All of the progress, so-called, that has happened was not because they were so smart or for any other reason except that they broke into a huge uh, store of energy in the form of oil and coal and natural gas that they're burning to keep this going. But they also use magic. This is the idea, as John Michael Greer, somebody who not only um, theorizes about magic and writes books, but also practices it, that magic is not the... Um, uh, transgression of the laws of physics, as most people think magic is. Magic is causing willed changes in consciousness, either in yourself or in other people. And television is exactly that. Television is black magic, he says, because television gets you to want to buy something you don't even really want just because your consciousness has been seduced into wanting to buy things. We call that advertising. And it's also something that the media uses to keep us from being able to realize what's going on by using magic in the form of highly edited and constrained so-called news to get us thinking about other things. And that works very well. Entire provinces of the empire ravaged by droughts, storms, and other disasters caused by the misuse of the earth's blood, while prophecies from the past warn of much worse to come. Right now, there's 70 wildfires raging in the United States in the West. A friend of mine who was a forest firefighter says that one-third of of all the forest in the United States and the West is projected to burn down. Um, meanwhile, far from the centers of power, the members of a scattered fellowship struggle to find and learn the forgotten lore of an earlier time, which just might hold the key to survival. And it was more or less at this point that the realization hit, we have somehow gotten stuck, all seven billion of us, 
inside the pages of a pulp fantasy novel. The idea, as John Michael Greer says, if you really want to understand what's going on in our world, you have to turn to pulp fantasy because I would argue fantasy is a genre that allows you to think about things that you can't phrase in the imagery of your everyday life. It was used in the past, for example, by Edmund Spencer to stage the supernatural concerns of you know, vices and virtues fighting and Protestant supremacy over Roman Catholicism with the imagery of fantasy in order to stage something that maybe you can't think about in the everyday in a stage that allows you to think about. This is why Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which I'm planning to do a whole series on, um, stages the concerns of Tolkien, which were not, you know, like so much one-to-one correspondences with historical events like some people try to say that lord of the rings is really about fascism like um that was what my eighth grade english teacher said uh that's not the case as far as tolkien himself said this is not like a historical allegory but it is a commentary on the way that traditions and ways of life that were thousands of years old were rapidly dissolving in favor of this homogenizing, impersonal, and thoughtless technological exploitation of the world. And that's what Lord of the Rings in many ways was about. And that's why it's a useful commentary on the state of our world with imagery that allows us to think thoughts that are basically unthinkable in ordinary uh, terms. And what you'll find with Conan the Chimerian, the topic of this video, is also in the story The Black Colossus, which if you haven't read anything by um, Robert Howard, I would recommend Black Colossus as a really great story to start with. It's super exciting and uh, definitely a lot more entertaining than anything that your professor who loves, pretends to love avant-garde literature with no plot, no characters, etc. precisely in order to distinguish themselves from the, the people who read Pulp Fiction, which is printed on basically recycled paper to be as temporary as like newspapers or magazines is basically the idea behind Pulp Fiction. Um, but it's it's more valuable for that reason because it speaks to the masses without the constraints of having to keep up these pseudo intellectual appearances of a tenured professor and therefore allows us to have the unrestricted play of, um, of you know, the imagination really to be able to think about this stuff. And Black Colossus is a story which is similarly, I think, something that can allow us to think about what's going on in our world with fantasy imagery. It's a story about an empire that's in turmoil, for which most of the scene of the story takes place in vast empty spaces amidst ruins. In fact, the very beginning of the story takes place with a thief trying to break into an abandoned temple from ages ago that has long since turned to ruins. And it's the story about what happens as dysfunction within the empire that is largely ignored by the elites grows and grows to the point that there's a small group of elites living in fear with armed guards behind walls. And there's more and more people on the outside of that, with, which is exactly a uh, description of what our world has turned into. We have these enclaves of privilege and elitism. We call them Washington, D.C. We call them Wall Street. We call them San Francisco and the Bay Area. We call them Hollywood, whatever you want to call them. We have these centers where the elites congregate and their absurd wealth pushes everybody onto the outside. And the outside is something which we call flyover country in the United States. Uh, we call the people who live there a bunch of ignorant rednecks or whatever to show that the outside is somebody not only that we don't need to think about, but somebody who's actually deserved to be put there. And you find if you turn on CNN that the elites who are safely in their towers in Manhattan broadcasting their perspective to try to influence the minds of the populace to willingly hand over more and more power to the elites against their own interests. They call it things like investing in technology, 
which is just a euphemism for automating jobs that working class people do and sending factories overseas. They call it educational progress, which is really just a euphemism for abandoning any of the skilled trades that could have made a person a living in order to go to college for a degree in women's studies or business in order to be completely at the mercy of some corporation to hire you. And it's the question of what happens when the elites in their towers in Manhattan um, become fewer and fewer by willfully outsourcing jobs and willfully doing layoffs and willfully uh, not expanding or distributing that influence outside of their own centers of power. While on the outside, there's more and more people joining the ranks, whether by by choice or by force. They're laid off from their job. They graduate from college $100,000 in debt and can't get a job without five years of experience. And the student loans drive them even deeper into poverty. And the thing you have to understand about the election of Trump in 2016 is it was one thing to watch the election of Trump from within the academic bubble. And I watched dozens of people that I knew on Facebook who were watching the election of Trump from the academic bubble. They were graduate students and professors and PhD students and, and undergraduate students. And the horror and un, and disbelief with which they watched the election of Trump was something that I had a different perspective on because in 2016, I was watching the election of Trump from the outside. I was officially all the way on the outside, just like Conan lives on the outside of those spheres of influence. And Black Colossus is a story about what happens when one of the elites goes to the outside for help. There's a princess, Yasmela, who is harassed by a demon, which is a monster that was enslaved in a tomb for, I guess, thousands of years before a thief broke into the tomb and unwittingly released the beast. And the beast had unlimited power, but still desired one thing above all. And that was, he was burning with lust for the princess Yasmela and would come to her while she was sleeping in her dreams and harass her. And she went to an oracle who told her, the only way you're going to solve this is by going to the outside. And the first man you see in the street, ask him to lead you. So she goes into the street late at night when she's been woken from her sleep by this horrible dream. And the first man she finds is a drunken barbarian leaving a tavern drunk on good wine. And that is Conan. And the idea that the elites leave their guarded palaces with great fear to find help on the outside is like what happened in our country when the elites from their towers in Manhattan and their, you know, government offices in Washington, D.C. Uh, watched with horror at the way that Trump won the election in 2016 because they vastly underestimated just how many people they put on the outside. And their narratives were talking about it, regardless of how you feel about Trump as a president. By the way, this is not an endorsement of him. This is just a this is just a truthful description of what I saw as somebody completely on the outside and living amongst outsiders. In late 2016, I had been off YouTube for two years. I'd been out of graduate school for two years. I had gone two years without opening a book on philosophy. I was um, I was uh, blacksmithing and brewing beer and doing carpentry and welding and um, trying to learn skills. I had a beard about this long, and um, I was living. I was working low end jobs and living amongst the outsiders. And the reaction to Trump among the outsiders, and this is not a white only thing, by the way. We have this. Um, yeah, definitely. When I go back to India, my wife's going to want the, the beard to come back. Um, I just have to keep up appearances for my job right now. But anyway, the thing is like. I know that this is controversial stuff, but it was not only a white, a white only thing because my best friend in late 2016 was an African American man who was a Trump supporter. Okay. And this idea that the outside is nothing but a bunch of ignorant rednecks in the South is what the elites tell themselves to justify um, the lack of privilege that the outside has compared to them. Um, and if, if you are um, from the South or white, by the way, that doesn't even matter. I'm not trying to make it about that. That's what the elites want to make it about. But the, but the reality is, if you're on the outside, it's not exactly, that's where I'm getting a lot of this, but it's also my own experience because I lived it. I lived the 
Shavikar rests on the fact that Russian, any race or class or whatever, uh, except that the elites try to use it. But the point I'm trying to make is that the narrative that the elites gave for the rise of Trump was so out of line with the way that it looked to the people who were actually living on the outside, like I was at that time, that they had no way to talk about what had happened. They had to rephrase it again with um, the same terminology that lost them the election in late 2016. And the question that Pulp Fiction allows us to ask is what happens when the gulf between the elites behind their walled towers and gates and those on the outside, the rift grows and grows and grows and the ways that the elites have of managing it become less and less effective to the boiling point is something with um, which uh, Black Colossus uh, frames in the narrative of, like I said, a, a monster gets released by a thief who tries to break in to steal uh, the treasure, which is a motif you also find in The Lord of the Rings, which is about a golden ring which changes hands, but actually curses the person who uh, gets a hold of it. And in fact, leads to the whole world going into self-destruction. A whole worldwide war is fought over one piece of gold is the irony of the Lord of the Rings, which is not a motif that Tolkien invented. It is a motif from the Dark Ages. If you read the Nibelungen Lied, which I've read in full, um, or Beowulf, which I've read multiple times, um, anytime gold appears, it's a motif that somebody's about to die. And that is because these are, in a certain sense, distortions over centuries of oral tradition about what happened in the fall of the Roman Empire, kind of like when you're a little kid, you play telephone, and the story sort of changes and changes, but it retains the essential parts. Uh, the idea was that the treasure, which in Beowulf leads to Beowulf's own death, okay, that's how Beowulf dies at the end, is over treasure, which he wasn't the thief who stole the cup from the dragon's lair, but he still dies as a result and when the other people at the end of Beowulf see the treasure, they don't rejoice like, mm, here's gold. Um, they actually fear because they know that they're going to die. And that's exactly what happens. More people come and they kill them for the treasure because that's what happened in the fall of the Roman Empire when um, archaeological digs will confirm that there are villas that they excavate um, in in the, the empire and the provinces, for example, which are always found burned to the ground by, by mobs. And the gold is always found a short distance away. And the archaeologists have concluded that means that they sacked this villa that once belonged to a wealthy Roman noble because they knew there was gold. They took the gold, it was taken a short distance away, and then they were killed too. And the way that that gold changed hands over the course of the Dark Ages, but always brought death to whoever got it, is the story that becomes Beowulf. It's the story that becomes the Nibelungen lead. It's the story that becomes um, Conan the Chimerian. It's the story that becomes the Lord of the Rings. And it's the story that we're going to have to deal with too. If you uh, listen to people like, um, like Alex Jones or Jim Rickards, who will acknowledge there's something wrong with the economy, they'll always say, oh, you just got to go out and get your gold and your guns. Okay. Um, and the problem, the fallacy with that is history has proven if you have gold the only thing that will guarantee is that somebody's going to be willing to break into your home and no matter how many of them you kill there will always be more of them by the way as john michael greer loves to say but anyway uh the idea in black colossus that the pursuit of gold is what releases the beast that um harasses the princess yasmela and leads her to consult the oracle who says go in the street and find the first man that you meet and just take it on faith that he's the one you have to um, get help from. She finds a drunken barbarian who is Conan. And she asks him for help because her empire is in turmoil, which he tells her even more than she's willing to speak it. He says to her, you do realize that, so you're the princess, you do realize your empire is completely in turmoil, right? And her way of bribing people to submission is by using gold. And he says to her, the gold is starting to run low. And it's only going to keep running low. We have the contrast in the story between her paid assassins and her paid mercenaries that she has to pay with gold. 
who are fighting half-heartedly and, of course, later in the battle just flat-out desert her versus guys like Conan who says, the first sound I, I heard when I was born was the, the um, fighting of swords, the clanging of the metal. So I've lived my whole life in this. I'm not doing it for gold. I fight because it's been my whole life. And that's the difference between the insiders who think that paying gold is the only way that they can get exactly what they want. And those on the outside who have a different set of values, a lot of alcohol without even if you meet him, uh, versus how soft have become that anything for themselves. If it's been my experience that most poor or lower middle class rural rednecks hate liberals because they don't work for a living, they only respect the power of money and Jesus. Well, the idea that um, the disrespect for the elites not having to work actually does hold some validity in the sense that studies have shown the more money you make, the less work you actually do. That's actually just a proven fact. And the most work I've ever had to do in my life, the hardest I've ever had to work was for the least amount of money. The lowest paying jobs I've had in my life were absolutely the most labor intensive, $7 an hour to unload truckloads of junk um, at a factory, um, 16 hours a week unloading truckloads of junk at Target. Um, at 3.30 in the morning, it is true that uh, the, the higher up you go, and that's actually nothing compared to a sweatshop worker in Bangladesh working 15 hours a day for less than, um, I don't know, a dollar a day or something like that. So there's some truth to that. And it's one of those things that breeds the same kind of both resentment by the outsiders for the insiders, but also is going to turn into weakness for the insiders because Hegel's slave master dialectic is about how by having the slave do all the work that he would have done for the master, the slave master dialectic is that the master desires something rather than do it. He just uses the slave to act out his desire. So the slave is laboring for another's desire, but because he's laboring, he grows strong. And because the master was not laboring, he becomes weak. And that's why the reversal happens where the master, where the, where the slave becomes the master is the Hegelian flip as it's called. And there's some truth to that. The elites become soft because rather than do anything, they use gold. But gold is cursed in the world of pulp fiction and dark age literature, where if your whole existence is staked on gold, it's more like a curse on you. And that's historically proven than it is a benefit in the long term. And what happens is that there's a difference in the in the story between gold and magic is one distinction I would make. Uh, my experience is that I need to communicate that they've aligned themselves with the ideology which enslaves them spiritually and economically. Yes, that's exactly the point of magic. The idea of magic, if you missed the beginning, that uh, sorcerers are using television basically to enslave us by filling us with ideology which defeats us and most of these people who say things like uh well the free market is going to dominate and everybody who works hard becomes rich which is basically the bill o'reilly talking points they didn't make it up themselves they heard it on talk radio or bill o'reilly and it's no accident that Lee with uh, magic have you read uh, Dark Star Rising. No, I have not. Is that a book of Pulp Fiction, uh, Magic, Peak Oil? What exactly is that? I admit there's a lot that I haven't read, um, but of course I'm always uh, interested in learning more. Um, and, and the idea of magic is that magic is not making physical things disobey the laws of physics, which is what most people think. It's rather using uh, uh, causing willed changes in consciousness either in yourself or in others. And advertising is that advertising is magic because it causes a change in consciousness to get you to buy something you don't even want. Right. Um, but there is liberatory magical practice, of course. And the idea that the idea also that you can kind of get out of magic altogether is I think something that is debatable um, in that even so much of the Christian practice of um, the Middle Ages was just straight up magic taken from uh, Neoplatonic doing the chants and the incense and the icons and all of that was actually just straight up magic. That's why the Protestant Reformation did away with all of that stuff. Um, politics in the Age of Triumph, magic and occult politics um, with Trump. OK, that's interesting. It's really interesting. Um, the, the, the rise of Trump is something which I've delayed talking about for months now because it's such a lightning rod. Uh, with because of magic, right? Like the media has used magic to make discussion on that topic impossible.
Okay. And you have to understand that if I if I talk about Trump from the perspective of what it looked like to be outside the bubbles of the elite in um the places I was in 2016, you have to understand it's one thing to describe what you actually experienced and another thing to endorse a politician. Those aren't the same thing, but the media has made it into the same thing, right? And that's the danger. But I think that their narrative is ringing true only for a smaller and smaller and smaller group of people. They've vastly miscalculated how many people are on the outside uh, because they never go there. They're just like the princess who will only go out there with armed guards, right? And an escort, right? Um, and the thing is, if you were on the outside in 2016, as I was, you got to see just how bad it looked for these, um, you know, like college students uh, with with signs about peace and love, you know, beating the shit out of people with Trump hats on. It looked really bad if you were outside of the um, the the university. Like it looked so virtuous if you were one of these, you know, eighteen year old protesters with a sign and who's never had a job in their life but knows a lot more about economics than all of us. Uh, it looked really bad, and that's not an endorsement of Trump. It's just a realization that that's part of the disconnect between the elites and everybody on the outside, which led to that happening and arguably will lead to it happening again in 2020, um, because there's been no indication I've seen that anybody on the far left has been willing to change that strategy, which did not work. And of course, the question for uh, Black Colossus, for example, is... What exactly happens when the people on the outside are no longer controllable by the people on the inside because the people on the inside largely use gold to control the people on the outside or to buy them off? But the people on the outside start to develop their own strategies. The outside is a place where magic is a really big thing. In fact, the leader of the um, the horde that they're fighting, she enlists uh, Conan to fight on her behalf against a guy uh, uh, who is a magician who's leading a horde of rebels. Basically, um, the resistance is led by people doing magic. So it's not led by a guy who also has a lot of gold that he can pay. It's led by a guy who does magic. He's a sorcerer. And the idea is that the resistance on the outside is going to be um, magical in nature, okay? And that's what they don't understand is that they use black magic to project CNN into households. Um, but uh, the outside also uses magic. And I think that this is why religion is going to play a bigger role in this than you think. Right now, all mainstream Christian interpretations, for example, are largely filtered by the media. You have either the prosperity gospel, which is that if you donate money to me, televangelists, God will donate five times more money to you, which is a scam that never works, obviously. And it preys on, you know, truly uh, gullible uh, souls who you really have to feel sorry for. But that's, uh, it seems like the mainstream of Christianity because it's projected on television, but it's actually a fairly small fraction of it. The other big thing right now is the political Christianity, as I mentioned, where um, the Roman Catholic bishops will issue orders saying, um, well, you know, you have to vote for Mitt Romney or John McCain or you're going to go to hell. Sorry if you vote for anyone except a Republican, you're going to hell. Um, and that's something that works in the um, in the short term, um, but it's not sustainable as a religious practice because you have to give people something more than just electing people that you as the bishop want them to elect. Uh, the other big type of Christianity right now is the apocalypse, the idea that the rapture is going to happen next week. So if your life is unbearable right now. Don't worry, you're going to be rescued from it tomorrow by the rapture. And the people I know personally who really get into the rapture are people who have reasons for needing it to happen. I will just put it that way. And I hope I don't offend anyone by saying that like one guy I know who uh, was, was shot in a drive-by shooting and uh, got paralyzed, and I'm not making light of his suffering at all, he really got into the rapture um, and looking for, for signs of the end times, etc. Because I have to say, he wanted life to be vastly different than it was. Okay. And I think that that's the other big thing. But I think all three of those options are unsustainable because they don't actually make a valid commentary on what's going on around us. We have to have, and there will emerge, by the way, some religious or spiritual or magical leader 
who turns our attention not on the next life or on electing politicians or on money, but rather on what's going on around us, which is like, look, the media gives us this bullshit that progress is still happening and there's being an economic recovery. Uh, but just look around you. It's not happening. And the rift between the inside and the outside is growing and growing. And we need a different alternative, which is to actively struggle against that. And that's what happens here. You have a magical leader rise up who leads the struggle. Hermetic and Neoplatonic techniques are good for perfuming one's mind and soul to fortify it against influences, which direct from the person will. Absolutely. And the idea that uh, magic has nothing both to teach us as moderns, but also nothing to do with the current situation is what John Michael Greer challenges. He says, most people when they hear about peak oil think it's an engineering problem. Like, mm, how can we uh, engineer something to run on sunlight? It's actually a magical problem in the sense that the problem is consciousness. The problem is narrative. The problem is myth. The problem is the will. And that's both how we're controlled to keep the nonsense going that is hastening our decline, but it's also where the secret's going to lie to changing the way that people think about this. And I guess the last thing I want to talk about here is the way that um, for the story of Black Colossus, um, eventually when the battle, the climactic battle happens, and um, I'm not going to spoil the ending, of course, uh, the princess uh, paid mercenaries desert her. And it really comes down to Conan having to defend her. It says she was no longer a princess, but only a terrified girl. In that the social status of being a princess was dependent upon an, an, an illusion that was maintained by staying behind the, the walls and, and having paid guards and, and gold. Once that was gone, she just became a terrified girl. And she found a sense of security in... Conan, who was so, someone she somehow, uh, no flame eyed shadow would bend over her in the darkness with this grim figure from the outlands standing guard above her. The idea that the figure from the outside has gained so much more strength, which is something that will withstand, by the way, even the dissolution of everything around you in battle is the difference between the inside and the outside, which I think is going to hold in the future as well. Conan is not somebody who loses his status as a, as a kick-ass fighter when, you know, the shit hits the fan in a, in the, in the heat of battle, the way that she loses her status as a princess, when things get rough, uh, he's somebody who maintains it. And that's the difference between the kinds of virtues, which more and more and more layers of abstraction and bureaucracy and gold and, and all of that will, will build up the elites who, once you take all that away, are nothing but terrified people. Um, Black Colossus was first published in 1933. Did Conan remain in weird tales? Uh, if you're asking about the, the uh, history of the publication of Conan, I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, I'm a fan, have been for years, but I don't have all of the publication at the, at, at the drop of a hat, to be honest with you. But I can say that... Um, Conan, as an early 20th century phenomenon, in my humble opinion, was something like Tolkien's uh, response to seeing the dissolution of old traditions and the replacement by these modernized lifestyles. And some people, uh, you know, fully embraced that and said, this is progress and this is where humankind has been on the way to for all of eternity. But uh, some people like Tolkien and Howard, I think, had the opposite response, which was not so much to romanticize the Dark Ages, but to realize that the narrative of the Dark Ages was a legitimate alternative. In a lot of ways, pulp fantasy is just going back to another narrative, which was not conjured out of thin air, by the way, but was rather the narrative of the Dark Ages. I think there's some historical um uh, knowledge, which was, was a prerequisite for these writers. Obviously, Tolkien was a scholar of Dark Age literature, and there's a lot of evidence in Conan that he's sort of rewriting the story. I mean, what is Conan really is just something of a rewriting of, among other things, the fall of the Roman Empire and the barbarians on the outside. I mean, it's set in a vastly prehistoric realm. Like when I was a kid, I saw Conan uh, the Barbarian and I wondered like, what era was that really? It's almost like prehistory, like almost so vastly distant that it predated any writing at all is the fantasy and in a certain sense, it is that, but it's also 
a meditation on what happened the last time uh, a vast empire vastly miscalculated the cost to actually run its empire and found that when the gold started running out and the plunder started running out and the resources started running out and the resistance built up on the outside, by the way, that real conflict would ensue and it would be a disadvantage to be a sheltered, pampered elite as opposed to a hardened barbarian. There's a good animated movie from the 70s called Wizards by Ralph Bakshi. I'm going to have to look that up. Uh, definitely sounds like the kind of thing that I would find interesting. Anyway, I'm going to uh, finish this stream now in that that's about all I have to say about that story of Conan. But I'm going to talk about um, The Hobbit and also The Lord of the Rings as a whole. I don't know how much of it I'll be able to cover before I leave for India. Uh, in about a month, but uh, I'm looking forward to talking about this stuff and uh, magic versus technology. Um, yeah, there's there's a difference. Technology um, is something for which you push a button and it does exactly what you want it to. And it's a highly dysfunctional way of relating not only to the world, which you use a machine to do things, but also to other people. In that the more and more we use machines, which have the model of you push a button and it does exactly what you tell it to, which is how some people wish language would work, quite frankly, like some people who lack nuance wish language was just tell people to do something and they do it. Uh, but it's a dysfunctional way of relating to the outside world and to other people. Great. Um, in that people don't really just do something because they're told unless they're being bribed by money or they're, they're literally enslaved, right? But otherwise they don't work that way. And You'll find that on the inside that works, but on the outside it doesn't. Conan the Chimerian doesn't um, relate to his outside world. Let me put it this way. The outsiders in all of the Conan stories don't relate to each other that way. They use magic, and they have charisma, and they have strength, and they build relations. And that's what's going to have to make a comeback. And I think that the elites especially, the more and more they have only the machine way of understanding Greer says that that's how Hillary Clinton expected her campaign to work, is she, as an elite, is so used to, especially with a lot of money, is, is so used to just telling people to do things and they do it. Uh, the Secret Service who served when Bill Clinton was president said that she used to make grown men in the Secret Service cry because there was no politeness or nuance. It was just do this, okay? And she expected the election to be like that. She would tell the American people, okay, uh, we need the first woman president and you're a sexist bigot if you don't do it. And just, just fucking do it, okay? Just do what I tell you. And we didn't listen. And a lot of us had to do it. Um, but when I say we, I mean the whole country. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll admit I didn't vote for her. I voted third party. Um, and that's a secret who, for which party exactly. But, uh, you know, it, <laughs> we didn't do it. A lot of us. A lot of us had to do it. Um, exactly. And there were no good options. That's why a lot of us voted third party. 90,000 people in Michigan voted for nobody. They just voted. Um, they just left it blank. Uh, and this, none of what I say is an endorsement of Trump. But it's also a realization that even if people had to do it anonymously, they didn't vote for Clinton overwhelmingly in the states that really swung the election. Um, the states where the feeding trough of empire is still going pretty strong, like Washington, D.C., New York City, uh, Seattle, um, San Francisco. She won pretty well uh, there. Are you in Michigan? Uh, Great Rapids? No, I don't live in Michigan. Uh, she did win Colorado because Colorado was living in something of an economic boom if you were an insider uh, from marijuana and things like that. Um, Colorado is not nearly as economically destitute as some other places I've lived. Like Oklahoma is a lot more destitute. And that's why Trump won every county in Oklahoma. Um, and that, I think that was one of the only states where Trump won every county. And definitely when I lived in Oklahoma, I got to talk to people about the election from the outsider's perspective, if I may say so, so bluntly, in that Oklahoma is especially a state where the elites are not going to be stopping to talk much to people. Um, so the perspective in Michigan were um, the uh, the ruins and something else from the Black Colossus is a lot of the landscape of Black Colossus is vast empty space with ruins which is um, the same thing in Lord of the Rings. A lot of the Lord of the Rings takes place in places that are empty, vast spaces where people used to live, but there's been a decline of an empire and war and natural disasters, and they've been depopulated. And uh, in Dark Age America, Greer says that 
90% population reduction after an empire goes into decline, um, finishes the process, is normal. That's not science fiction. It's normal for there to be 90% um, depopulation. Um, England, after in the Dark Ages, for example, there's a um, there's a, an account in the Dark Ages, I think, I, I hope I get the number right, where there was a battle, a huge battle in Dark Age England, where there were like 50 guys on each side, right? And that would, that would have been a joke by standards of the Roman Imperial Army at its, in its heyday, but uh, England had become so depopulated that, you know, armies were a couple dozen guys, right? And I voted for Ralph Nader in 2009, or 2,900, which I guess that's impressive. I'm just kidding. And uh, 2004, that's why I push, uh, sorry, uh, this is trying to be a smart ass, 2000. Um, the thing is, I've I, I've not even registered to vote since um, a while ago because I, I don't even see so much the point in voting anymore except with my feet, which is I did vote to not pay my student loans anymore. And that's a lot more significant, I think, than voting for a guy with a D or an R or a girl, in this case, Hillary Clinton, um, after their name. And the voting to stop paying your student loans is actually going to cause a uh, revolution because bursting that bubble is far more important than electing a president who happens to be a woman, but of course still supports all of the war and economic bailouts. And yeah, the, the funny thing is like all these people are talking about Hillary Clinton as like, um, you know, uh, um, was it like, um, loving loving middle easterners while she while she caused like hundreds of thousands of deaths in syria but she loves her arabs right that was the bullshit which the media gave us but you know uh once again not an endorsement of trump but it's one of those things where it was a it was a measure of how morally bankrupt you were if you could claim to be against war bailouts for the rich all of that stuff elitism all of that stuff as as that's what you're supposed to be as a far left political activist and yet you'll do anything to get Hillary Clinton elected. Um, and that's something which if you were on the outside, if you were on a college campus, you had to do it. Okay. If you're a PhD candidate now, you have to be also a political activist. And I don't mean a political activist in the sense of raising questions. No one's asking. I mean, literally just, you know, like a, a campaigner for Hillary Clinton, which was what, what a PhD candidate had to be 2016. And it looked fine if you were on a college campus, but if you were on the outside, like me, they didn't realize how bad it made them look and exactly how morally bankrupt they looked to switch overnight from Bernie Sanders to the enemy uh, overnight just because she won. And it's the difference in perspective, which most people, if they didn't live on the outside, if they didn't go to flyover country, rural Oklahoma, and work with the poor like I did, uh, they won't understand it. But it's one of those things which is going to only worsen and worsen. And rather than pretend it's not happening, pulp fantasy gives us the resources to talk about it that we otherwise don't have. So that's going to conclude the live stream. Thank you for watching. I look forward to talking about, uh, I think Lord of the Rings will be the next one. So thanks for watching. Trump validated a lot of people like my family who think <laughs> black are so subhuman. Okay. I'm not laughing at, uh, the statement is uh, the uh, frankness of it. The, the thing about Trump was he did hijack a lot of things that people have been thinking but not willing to say, which is why none of what I said is an endorsement of Trump. But at the same time, offensive comments were less important to the people on the outside than the economic issues, if I can put it that way. So Trump mocked a reporter whose arm was like this, right? And like, that's pretty offensive. Uh, but if you're a laid off factory worker in Ohio, who really just cares about getting a job, rather than one comment about a guy with an arm like this, um, it's, it's simply, that's what the elites don't understand, because the elites don't have to actually worry about putting food on the table. Um, and they never have, right? Uh, so everything can hinge on mocking a reporter, and I should really stop doing that because then I'm mocking him too, which I'm not, but that might be how it looks. Um, everything hinges on one offensive comment if you don't have to actually worry about economic issues. But if you're a laid-off factory worker in Indiana, okay, um, that's not what is going to decide the election because you have to actually worry about getting a job. And that's that disconnect, which they didn't understand, 
And I'm not saying Trump has done anything to actually bring back manufacturing. Um, ultimately, it's something which you can't bring back without severe economic reordering, which is ultimately going to be changing the way that we do international financing. And uh, nobody's going to be able to bring back manufacturing without a complete collapse of that. Uh, but he was at least talking about it. And Hillary Clinton's response was, we need to shut down the coal mines and basically give government subsidies to solar panel companies, right? And what, what she didn't realize was what that actually sounds like to a, a person on the outside is we need to lay off the unskilled laborers in Pennsylvania and, um, and West Virginia and just hire a bunch of scientists and engineers with PhDs um, at, from elite universities to make solar panels. Of course, if you're an elite, that's exactly what you should be doing is subsidizing scientists and engineers. But if you're a working class person in West Virginia, that's going to sound like a declaration of war against you, and which is exactly what it was, by the way. So I'm just going to leave with that. And um, God, it feels so great to be able to say this. You know, like if I was a PhD candidate, I would never in a million years be allowed to say what I just said because I'd have to go through this bullshit of maintaining a profile as a political activist for Hillary Clinton. And it's just such a breath of fresh air to not be constrained by the bullshit and to actually have the freedom to say what's true and to talk about Pulp Fiction, which your, your average PhD candidate in literature won't talk about because they have to talk about, you know, some, uh, you know, avant-garde, you know, thing that nobody has read. They haven't even really read it themselves, but they have to show how smart they are that they can read a book with no plot. It's so great. It's freedom. And the idea that you can only be an intellectual or whatever, if you're also a PhD candidate, is exactly what this challenge is about. Uh, the, this channel is about challenging. In fact, you will learn straight up more from watching my videos than I learned when I was in graduate school. If you really want to learn about philosophy or whatever, don't go to uh, spend $100,000 at a university. I can already teach you more than I learned, or not so much I'm teaching you. It said, we'll discuss higher things here than anything you'll find at the university. Um, so anyway, that will conclude this. Where did you go to grad school? I went to grad school two places. I graduated from University of Colorado at Boulder, which shelved my department a few months ago. They shut it down despite having an increase in interest in the university since I left due to marijuana being legalized. Every 18-year-old um, pothead uh, sh jumped on the bandwagon to pay out-of-state tuition just to smoke some pot, which is ridiculous. Because uh, believe me, you could smoke pot in Oklahoma. Everybody there does it. Um, uh, so that's just ridiculous. But anyway, um, they, they shut down the, the department, which is the fate of every department around the nation. That's not Ivy league, by the way. And then I went to Illinois, um, which was an absolute waste of time. Uh, I'll just say that I actually lost money, borrowing money from my family to move across the country and learn not a damn thing the whole semester, except some Russian. I did take a Russian 100 class, which was the best class in grad school, uh, ironically enough. But, um, yeah, so I, I went to grad school, but I would not recommend anybody to even waste their time with that because I did that. You're, first of all, not going to learn anything. You're probably going to go deep in debt, and uh, you're sure as hell not going to get a job afterwards. Uh, so I have a few more weeks as a truck stop janitor. I'm going to have to give my two weeks notice pretty soon here because I'm going back to India, and I won't do that forever. I'm really wanting to get back into woodworking and blacksmithing when I go back to India, and I will open a school of philosophy. It really exists already. You're part of it. This is it. Uh, but another school of philosophy um, that will meet in a, a wood shop or a blacksmith shop. Um, but anyway, if you're watching this, don't even waste your time with grad school. I'll just tell you, it's it's a waste of time. It's not going to help you. It's just going to put you in debt. You're not going to learn anything. You're just going to have to uh, go through this nonsense of being a political activist. And it's not going to do you any good. So, and besides, you know, like, how much do you actually read anything in grad school? You might read like this much of the slave master dialectic and phenomenology of spirit, if you're lucky. And that's all you'll read of Hegel. It's just a waste of time. So anyway, thanks everybody for watching. I look forward to the Lord of the Rings series and uh, thanks for the comments.